This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Upgrade your business with Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. Shop Pay boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning fewer carts going abandoned and more sales going cha-ching. So if you're into growing your business, get a commerce platform that's ready to sell wherever your customers are. Visit shopify.com to upgrade your selling today. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. Today on the Andrew Cooperwriter Show, we're going to take a focus on the state supreme court race. I think an incredibly important race, more important than many of them going on, despite the fact it gets zero attention from literally like anybody. And that's part of the reason why we have such a liberal court. I mean, let's keep in mind that the court that signed off on Bashir going ahead and keeping us all locked down for as long as he is able to was the state Supreme Court, a Supreme Court so liberal that many of the more I guess you'd call them conservative lawyers, lawyers that fight for conservative or liberty issues, prefer to go to the federal court to fight on any kind of constitutional issue than to go to the state courts, even even if it's a violating the state constitution as well as the federal constitution. They will choose to go to the federal courts because our courts have become so incredibly partisan. I mean, we've seen what happens in front of judges like Judge Shepard in Franklin County that hears just about every single case that's against the state. We've seen the rank partisanship that occurs, and, well, it just goes to show. And and, and honestly, these uh, uh, are incredibly important positions. I mean, for an example, the entire reason why Amendment 2 is on our ballot right now has to do with the fact that the state Supreme Court was so partisan. See, our, our... uh, uh, Constitution has a line in there about making sure that uh, the the government has to provide funding for a common school system. And so the state Supreme Court over time has interpreted that to mean public schools and that funding can only go to our traditional public school system. Well, there's some other states that have had similar things in their constitutions but have been able to get some types of school choices in place without even having to pass a constitutional change. Why? Because, well, there's a doctrine that says that money does not become a part of the government's money until it's left the account of the taxpayer. So that's why things like tax incentives, uh, a tax rebate, well, tax rebates wouldn't be, but tax incentives, um, tax credits, those kinds of things aren't necessarily considered to violate quite the same way other constitutional uh, items may be when it comes to funding, because it's not viewed as funding. Allowing the taxpayer to keep more of their money is not viewed as funding, typically. And so with that in mind, the school choice advocates had put forward bills such as ESAs and, and educational savings accounts, that is, and bills that allow for opportunity scholarships. These were uh, a scholarship system set up where people could donate money to nonprofits and then receive a, a a tax deduction for doing so. And the state Supreme Court ruled that is unconstitutional in a way that broke with every single other state that has had this issue come before their state Supreme Court that has had similar provisions in their state constitution regarding the funding of public schools. So this is an incredibly important body that is the left's last bastion. And and when they make a decision, when they make case law, that affects everything going on. It can affect what kind of laws you can even pass at all. Because if they interpret something to violate the Constitution, a law, well, the, 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 the legislators can't just go make a new law now. They have to, uh, either one, they could be precluded from ever being able to make a law in that direction again, depending on what the ruling was. Or, in order to move forward with it, they need to pass now a constitutional change. (laughs) And then they have to hope that what they pass forward as a constitutional change 
actually is clear enough to the state Supreme Court justices that they don't try to read into it something that doesn't exist. So it's it's a big, important race that literally affects not just what happens in our lifetime, but can affect what happens in, in generations from now and deserves the kind of attention that uh, a governor's race would get. But that isn't what our state Supreme Court races get. And a big part of it is because you can't really make a very educated decision on who to vote for. They can't talk about prior cases, really, or don't like to volunteer uh, uh, you know, details from that. So if you want to look up their rulings, want to look up how they've uh, really handled different situations uh, easily, generally speaking, you have to be a lawyer. You have to have some access to uh, some other places, and it just doesn't really get published and then if you try to ask them how they would rule on a case, so you're not going to get much of a response either. I always thought it would be really interesting and a lot more worthwhile if, as we're looking at these state Supreme Court races, if instead we gave uh, these judges, like, maybe three cases or something where they sat and they listened to people argue a case and then they issued an opinion and then they could debate about why they issued that opinion. And it's a fake case, maybe, but it's a case that was done that could be done for the state Supreme Court races so we can hear how do they handle cases? How do they rule on something? What kind of questions do they ask? How does it turn out? So we can get an idea of who we're voting for. But of course, we can't make educated decisions like that on these nonpartisan judge races that literally affect for generations to come because that'd be too much to ask for. In fact, we can barely get a debate. Instead, what we got. And what I'm covering today is a quote-unquote candidate forum in Frankfurt that was aired on Frankfurt Plant Board's, I believe, local channel or what have you. Probably watched by literally hundreds of people, you know, (laughs) maybe hundreds. I mean, on YouTube, the video of the forum has 65 views. And, of course, it was aired on the TV there, but how many people really watched it, you know, I don't know. But you would hope it would get more coverage, but I haven't seen really anything coming away from the candidate forum in the media. And there was certainly one part that if we had media focusing on the right things, local media, they would certainly be covering. Because for, you know, in this case, Justice Goodwin, Goodwine, Goodwine, I believe it's Goodwine, for Goodwine, who's a current appellate court judge running for state Supreme Court, One of the lines that was dropped by Izzo in this, Aaron Izzo, she's running uh, um, against her, but one of the lines dropped by Izzo in this debate is, in my opinion, very damning. It's something that I think we should be asking over and over and over again from Goodwine of why does she deserve to be a state Supreme Court justice Uh, when we have one of these statistics that Izzo ends up talking about. So I'll get to that here in a bit. Um, Make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe. By the way, I know I'm eight minutes in, but I haven't said that yet. But let's dig down in. Let's start off. uh, Let's listen to some of this candidate forum. And and let's just start off with the opening remarks here. um, And go ahead and and see what what you feel from it. Thank you very much, JC. And please let me echo his thanks to uh, the Frankfurt Chamber as well as uh, the Frankfurt Plant Board and Channel 10 for inviting us here to speak. Um, My name is Erin Izzo, and I am running for the Kentucky Supreme Court. A little bit about myself here personally. My husband and I, we live here in Frankfurt over on the east side, and so this is a place I've called home since we've moved here uh, from Lexington and right in the middle of COVID, July 2020. Professionally speaking, I'm a partner at Landrum and Schaus, where I've litigated or I have litigated for 19 years. Uh, I also serve as an arbitrator, and as an arbitrator, I do a lot of the same things that uh, judges do. Attorneys come before me in cases. They argue the evidence. I hear the evidence and render decisions. I listen to witness testimony, and I also preside over trials and, and render awards. Um, So this is what I bring. This is the experience that I bring here. Um, Often these cases deal with complex issues such as wrongful death, catastrophic injury, and or uh, discrimination cases as well. 
Litigation-wise, uh, I've represented clients on both sides of the V, both plaintiffs and defendants, uh, in these uh, complex cases for the 19 years. Um, employment matters, especially with the focus on discrimination, either racial or gender discrimination, is has been where my where my make my bread and butter, I said, suppose I could say. Um, but enough about that. I look forward to serving uh, the people of the Commonwealth and the people of Franklin County here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Goodwine, two minutes. Thank you, JC, and thank you to the Frankfurt Chamber and the Plant Board for hosting this forum so that our community members can learn about the critical importance of this election. My lifelong goal to serve on the Kentucky Supreme Court has driven by my proven commitment to justice and the power of the law to protect and serve every citizen. I have dedicated my life and career to upholding the principles that are the firm foundation of our legal system. I work hard every day for the people of Kentucky, serving as a judge on the Court of Appeals. I am prepared to put my 25 years experience as a judge and the utmost in skills, honesty, integrity, ethics, and work ethic, as well as my dedication to justice for all to work for you on the Kentucky Supreme Court. I am the only candidate for Kentucky's highest court who has ever been a judge. My opponent has never been a judge, although she does say that she's done things that a judge can do. However, I have served as a judge at every level of the judiciary so far and earning me the utmost skill and experience needed to serve you on the Kentucky Supreme Court. We have seen the impact of judicial decisions and we find ourselves at a critical juncture where the importance of a highly skilled, fair and impartial judiciary cannot be overstated. Our courts must be bastions of integrity with practitioners who have the utmost skill and experience ensuring that the rule of law is applied fairly and equitably. That is how I have served every day for 25 years as a judge and how I will serve as a justice. You've heard the counties in which will be on the ballot this fall and I look forward um, to serving you as a justice and ask, humbly ask for your vote to ensure that the Kentucky Supreme Court Court is a beacon of justice for all. Thank, Thank you. you both for your opening. So there you go. That's uh, the opening statements there. And what it really comes down to is what do you want to see on the state Supreme Court? So you've got a person who is almost solely practiced privately as a lawyer for what is a well-known law form. And then another who has stated she's always wanted to be on the Supreme Court. And I think this distinction is important because I think we're going to keep something in mind here. Okay, so when you're working on – so Izzo brought up how she is a arbiter, okay, which means that lawyers come before her to argue cases before they go into courts. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Upgrade your business with Shopify, home of the number one checkout on the planet. Shop pay boosts conversions up to 50% meaning fewer carts going abandoned and more sales going cha-ching. So if you're into growing your business, get a commerce platform that's ready to sell wherever your customers are. Visit shopify.com to upgrade your selling today. But she is privately hired. She's privately decided upon, okay? So this isn't, that means that Izzo doesn't just have experience as a judge. She's fulfilling the role of like a judge. But rather, she has to be so fair and impartial that lawyers continue to decide to use her. You see, here's the thing. You don't have a choice of your judge when you uh, – you don't get to shop around so much for your judge, especially when you get to the Supreme Court and appellate court. right? You, you have the judges you have, period. You don't have a choice. There's – no one can go anywhere else. You know, it's it's – it's like the DMV, right? They, they don't have a reason to give you good customer service and to make sure they're extra great because where else are you going to go? You're stuck there. It's the same thing with the judge, right? If a judge is good or bad, it doesn't matter. They get paid the same amount. They, they get to sit on the bench still, and they're so often not challenged that they'll probably just continue to hold on to their position anyways. But when you are privately hired to act as a judge, that means you must be fair. You must be straightforward if you want to continue to be hired because they can go somewhere else. They can go to another arbiter. If they don't think you're going to be honest and fair, 
They can go elsewhere. And I do think that matters because if you've spent more time basically in a competition of who's the fairest in order to make a living compared to if you've just held elected office forever, I, I think that may actually create somebody that's more impartial and more fair because they've had a financial interest to be that way. On top of that, I think it's worth putting out that Goodwine did say she wanted to be a state Supreme Court justice like her entire life. And anybody who's listened to the show for any length of time knows the minute somebody says they've wanted to be in office since they were a young kid or they've been eyeing it up for a long time, I get extremely suspicious because that means you're willing to say and do anything you need to do to achieve your goal. That's human nature. When you have a goal, when you have something you're trying to reach, it's human nature to do whatever you need to do to reach that goal. And that might include making promises. That might include ruling on things, not in a way that's fair, but in a way that helps you out the best. And that is always something we need to watch out for. So now let's hear this first question. I believe they throw it to Izzo first. Uh, so they ask her a question. Let's hear what she has to say. Statements. Thank you very much. Great job. Our first question is going to come from Chamber President and CEO, Ms. Tish Shade. It's going to be directed to you, Ms. Izzo. You're going to have a one-minute response. Thank you. How do you think judges can maintain the public's trust in the court system? Oh, goodness. All right. Wide open question here. Um, well, one of the foremost things that we need to ensure is that our judges and our justices who are serving us maintain an absolute uh, absolute neutral um, position on their cases. We want to make sure that the judiciary is completely independent and is free from outside influence. Um, this can be things such as uh, political uh, guarantees or political contributions. It could also be things such as conflict and recusing from, from cases where there's a conflict issue. Um, so these are things that are important. Um, it's something that I've prided myself throughout my practice here um, and by pull-off cases if there is a conflict, whether it's through arbitration or uh, with my litigation as well. So I think that's important to our voters, and it's something that I will bring with me to the bench. So... First, I want to talk about the format here, and I'm saying this as a candidate who's who's been on candidate forums and who's been at debates and everything. Uh, one minute response time in order to respond to questions. That's why I hate these darn things. I really do. You know, there's all these groups, all these different groups out there. You know, women's clubs and and and. Uh, uh, parties and all these other people that will decide they want to have a forum. You know, I remember when I was running statewide, literally every single little group decided they wanted to have a forum. And, and before we got to a big televised debate, which was on KT, it wasn't really a debate, but on KT, we had done basically forum debated each other like 10 times in front of crowds of like five people that nobody watched. And so by the time we got to the point where we could really go out there and debate, we had done already like practice debating each other. I still think I did pretty well in the KT debate personally. But my point is, is that all these, and this is just such a frustration. So if you're listening to this and you work in the Republican Party and everything this, just just take this with a, with a grain of, of salt or at least listen to what I'm saying as a former candidate. Stop. Don't use up, you're, you're, you're doing a disservice to the candidates and, and when you keep holding these forums and things like that for one party here or there. What you should do is get together with several counties, parties, host your forums if it's during the primary, host your forums, quote unquote forums, what's, we'll return to that word in a second, host your forums all as one. And make sure you invite a lot of people out there to be there. Make sure all the county parties get together. Make sure you're stuck in that room with 150, 200, 300 people. Make sure you get it big. Make sure it's worth those candidates' time. Because then I get it. I know these parties are like, look, you know, we want to do this for the community. We want to invite people out. And every vote matters. But at the same time... When you have somebody running statewide, having them drive three hours to debate their opponent 
to give their opponent time to prepare for what you're going to hit them on during a bigger debate in front of five people giving them debate practice, well, it's not something candidates generally want to do. They hate doing it because it just politically doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you as a, polit- as, a, as a former politician, as a former candidate for office. Here's the other thing. Stop doing forums. And I, and I get it. You know, you, they, they want to do forums. They say it's forum because they're like, well, we'd hate to have a debate. We'd hate to, hate to hear them debate things. If you want to do a real service, a real service for the voters that show up, you want to really help people make up their mind, let them have a debate. I promise you. I promise you this. There is nobody who knows more about the things that you should ask about about each candidate than their opponent. Their opponent has studied them. Their opponent knows exactly what they've said. Their opponent should know their history on things. If they have a voting record, their opponent knows it. It knows it better than you all do. And so if you just want to invite candidates out to give you a stump speech and lie to your face with nobody there to call them on them, then ask for that. Don't call it a forum. Just say, hey, you're going to come out and you're going to speak to our group. And you can talk about whatever you want to talk about for 10 minutes. Just say that because that's what it turns into. Now, if you actually want to be an informed voter, if you actually want the people, if you want to host an event that you want people to learn something about those in front, if you actually want to have an event that helps somebody make up their mind of how to vote, don't have a forum, have a debate. And don't get in between the two of them going at each other either, or three of them, or however many. The only thing you should be doing is making sure that if if somebody starts interrupting somebody a lot, you kind of break it up and just who's ever talked less, say, go ahead and say your point or finish your point in a few minutes. Okay, now let's flip over to this guy. Okay, respond. (coughs) If they start stepping on each other a whole lot. Otherwise, just let them go. This one minute to respond to a question. Oh, that sounds just stellar. Thank you for one minute. Nobody learns anything in a minute. It's just uh, so stupid. And and you could tell it's it's done by people who either A, they want either politics to be what it used to be. You know, because I heard this all the time as a candidate. Look, we want it to be nice and fair and cordial. We don't want you all attacking each other and blah, 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 blah. Just stop. This isn't that anymore. Because all, all the old thinking, and I'm going to call it old thinking, of supposedly not wanting candidates to, to go at each other and really debate their ideas comes from a time where politics got so corrupted based on who has the most money, because that's who's going to win, who has the most money, that that has what's led us to be where we are. We did not show up where we are now without that level of thinking, without this thinking of let's just all get along and, and, and candidates just to be super nice to each other all the time. That's what's best. You don't need to disrespect them as a person. But you should be able to call them out. And to this, this demand to be like, oh, I want both candidates out. I want them to talk, but I don't want them to call each other out. It's, it's just so pitiful to me. I do. And I know some of you are really offended. Don't be. Just listen to what I'm saying to you. Take it, take it with a grain of salt. But if you actually want to learn something about who's before you, Don't give them a one minute to respond to a question and then tell them they can't debate each other. Let them debate. Let them go against each other. If you actually want to find out, if you want to know why you shouldn't vote for each person and why you should, only the candidates themselves can do that. Not some moderator isn't going to help you arrive at that decision. Anyways. I'll get off my soapbox. Sorry, it's just always something that bothered me as a candidate. That, you know, we'd we'd show up at these events and they'd be like, now we want you all to get along. We don't need you guys going back and forth and all these other things. And and, and that's another way of saying, look, we want to let each of you just lie 
and nobody call you out on it because we think that's how we service the voters. It's just so irritating that we have people complicit that say they're there to inform the voters that instead just want to facilitate them lying and let them get away with it. But anyways, so the question, and what Izzo's hitting on here, back to what she was asked, for those of you who can remember, uh, I was talking about keeping the impartiality of the courts together and so on and so forth. So, and keeping them trusted. So what Izzo is hitting on here is that good wine is clearly being bought. Uh, you know, Izzo, I think, has 40, 50K. Good wine has like 500K. I mean, the teachers' unions out of Louisville alone has spent $200,000 to get good wine elected. That's a lot of money. So she's trying to hit upon that. Now, here is uh, uh, what good wine has to say. Um, in response. So she's also asked the same question. Let's hear what she has to say. Judicial races are nonpartisan in Kentucky, and it is critical that we maintain that impartiality. It is critical that in every decision that we make as a justice, that we put aside any personal um, biases or any personal views, regardless of what our opinion may be about the law in which we are interpreting. It is critical that we always, always set aside partisanship and that we maintain impartiality. I've been a registered independent since I became a judge, and I know that continually displaying a strong work ethic, honesty, integrity um, to ensure that the cases are decided fairly for all involved. Thank you. So I want you to remember exactly what she said. She said, despite our opinion... Of the law, we need to decide the cases fairly. Despite our opinion of the law. Remember that for two reasons. First, it's weird that she'd use the word opinion. Because that is literally what she's asked to do. She said, we need to decide fairly despite our opinion. Well, you're asked as a Supreme Court justice to issue opinions... On laws. That's what you're supposed to do. So I don't quite understand what she means about despite her opinion on the law. That's literally all you're doing is giving your opinion. And then if your opinion agrees with the majority of the justices, they come together on an opinion that they, the majority of the justices agree upon, that gets issued as the ruling. So yeah, your opinion on the law is the only thing that matters. But I want you to keep that in mind too. Because she says something later on that conflicts with that statement. I'm pro- I'm sure she probably means by opinion like the layman's terms, but it just stuck out to me as odd. Now, she brings up her registration as a nonpartisan, and there's a big argument over whether judges' races should be partisan or not. Because, you know, the argument would be, well, they should be impartial, they, sh- they shouldn't matter whether they're a Republican or a Democrat, and I hear you on that topic. However, if somebody is Republican they have a series and set of general beliefs. And if they're a Democrat, they'll have a series and set of general beliefs. For an example, a Democrat does not believe life begins at conception and believes uh, in, in abortion at some point, generally speaking. And that, to me, maybe would mean that they devalue life. So in this next clip, it's, it's more so interesting, not as much because of the response, But frankly, the question wasn't good, and it seems like the person asking it realizes it, like partially through asking it. Uh, Take take a listen to the question here. One minute. Okay. Uh, Thank you all for being here. Obviously, uh, we're with the Chamber of Commerce. We represent a lot of businesses uh, here in town. So uh, my question focuses on business. how would you balance the need for legal stability with evolving business practices and technologies? Could you be more clear? Uh, I, or could you? Yeah. Re- <laughs> um, That's a very broad question. I'm yeah. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> with, uh, we, we might have new technologies, new businesses that come. Is there any flexibility uh, as we move forward in, I, I don't know, in, just if something comes to you that you've never had before because it's a new business, new technology, how would you handle that situation? Oh, that's a good question. Um, 
Well, of course, things always evolve over time. We have new businesses. Of course, right now, the influx of AI has happened, and there's right. a, a big push to really incorporate things like that. Um, what I do, of course, would look at what laws are in place, the legislative uh, legislatures and how they are examining this particular issue, because how new things are addressed is really a legislative role. Now, in the absence of that, I look at precedent and see what sort of values we have um, with, that are established by our precedent that's legal uh, decisions that are binding, um, and use that to explore different things. Um, in the context of AI, just for example, um, concerns that might be there is, okay, is the AI truly uh, self-generating? Is it truly thinking about this? Or is it self-biased because it's influenced and put together by someone with a particular viewpoint? Um, we've seen that in some things in the news here, and I don't know the veracity of any of that. But that's how I would approach it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One minute. Thank you, Kathy. That's a great question. Um, one thing I'm not sure that a lot of the public is aware of and that the Supreme Court has undertaken is to start business courts. And that's one of the very reasons why the Supreme Court has undertaken that task is because business courts sometimes face those specialties that is not common in everyday court. And so there was a pilot project that was launched in Jefferson County to assist with that. Um, and and it's, it's working successfully now. Um, what I would do, again, is surround myself with professionals who can help me understand, again, the specific technologies at hand and rely on those who are presiding in business course to help shed some light on those answers. Okay, so that was that person from that particular chamber's first question. And that is their post most important question. Apparently, I didn't think it through. Because obviously it's very open ended. You have one minute to respond, uh, and you know, and and partially I could say that this was a dumb question because of the question asker's fault. But I think a big part of it has to do with once again how hamstrung you are when it comes to these judge races. You cannot ask the kind of questions you'd like to ask because you can't go into specifics. You can't say, how would you rule on this specific case dealing with X, Y, Z? Now, obviously, going to something like AI becomes very important. I think that's mainly kind of what she's talking about. You have emerging technologies like AI, like other things that uh, come about and create issues well before anybody can make a law on it. How do you handle it? But that's a hard question to answer when you don't know the details of a specific case. Very difficult. Now, like I said, as I own something specific like AI and I think you know kind of getting in a groove there with AI and, and her response by Izzo is pretty important now Goodwine's response isn't bad at all all referencing the knowledge of business courts that's good but she said something in there and I think this is always like I said maybe the problem with judges that don't have a lot of real world experience she talked about surrounding herself with experts with more knowledge on subjects and the question is who are those experts see that's that's the thing when it comes to any of these politicians, right? It's hard to think that these politicians sit there and say, I'm going to be super corrupt. This is what the people of my district don't want, but this is what the donors want. So I'm just going to do what the donors want. I'm not here to, to help the people of the district. I don't think they think that way, really. I think what's closer to what's going on with most elected people is simply this. They get asked to vote on certain things, and they get informed on those subjects by certain people. And those people who are giving them the information are those who have access to the politician. And those people who have access could be donors, could be the people who give them money, because obviously it's natural. If somebody gives you 10 grand, a million dollars, even if you're a congressman, or you know, 200 grand in this case, well, you're going to pick up the phone when they call. You're going to develop a relationship with them. And then when you have a question about schools, let's say, who are you going to talk to? Who are you going to ask a question to when you're trying to understand something better? You're going to ask the people you have a relationship with. Or they might come to you and talk to you, and you're going to pick up that phone call. And maybe you want to pick up the phone call when somebody from the other side or with a different opinion called because, well, they didn't give you that 200 grand when you're running for judge. Or you would just kind of cast their opinion to the side, you never take notice, or so on and so forth. And the issue <clears throat> is, is who do you listen to? 
And that's why many times when politicians are challenged on why they voted on subjects or why did you do this or do that, one of the common phrases you'll hear, especially at the state level, I hear this all the time when politicians are challenged, is you just don't understand. You're misinformed. The information isn't getting out there. Oh, they, they just, they don't understand what's going on. They're being educated by social media and Twitter. I mean, you'll hear them lament this. And I, I think in large part, that thought process is because they think you are not as well informed on them on a subject because they had this person who's donated hundreds of thousands or thousands or whatever, depending on the level, this person who's been large donors to them come in and tell them what to think on a subject. And now they take that as they're the expert. And they're not going to listen to another expert because another expert hasn't paid them lots of money to make them listen to them. Makes sense? I don't think it's just necessarily as straightforward as ignore this person or that, but it's about who has access based on who's given you the money. I think that's incredibly important. Now, I, I want to skip forward here to the closing. I want you to really listen to both sides here on the closing and kind of draw your opinion. I'll, I'll go over what I think about it, but let's take a listen to how they closed out here because there's a moment where Izzo made a pretty big statement that really should have a little bit more attention. Take a listen. Thank you, JC, and thank you again to the Frankfurt Chamber and Plant Board for hosting this forum. Kentuckians need a justice on our highest court that embodies and demonstrates the utmost in honesty, integrity, ethics, work ethic, skills, and experience, as well as a deep understanding of the complexities of the law and a commitment to the approaching each case with dedication to the rule of law and justice for all. That is how I have earned my strong reputation during 25 years of dedicated service as a judge and what I will continue to deliver serving you as a justice on the Kentucky Supreme Court. I am invested in the people and communities I serve, and I humbly ask for your support and your vote to ensure that the Kentucky Supreme Court remains a bastion um, of justice for all. Upon election to the Kentucky Supreme Court, I will be the first woman and only the fifth person in history to have served at every level of the judiciary in Kentucky. In my 19 years of dedicated service as a trial judge on district court and circuit court, I have tried all kinds of complex cases. And while on the Kentucky Court of Appeals, I have interpreted complex legal issues, crafted thoughtful comprehensive and well-reasoned opinions and managed a high caseload, all of which have uniquely qualified me to serve as a justice and for justice for all. I humbly ask for your vote, Pamela R. Goodwine, Kentucky Supreme Court, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would please spread the word to your friends and families in my eight counties that I am the best qualified candidate for this position and the only candidate who has ever been a judge. Ms. Izzo, two minutes, closing remarks. Yes, thank you very much. And I want to reiterate my gratitude to uh, the Frankfurt Plant Board, to the uh, Chamber of Commerce and Channel 10 for inviting us here. Um, I firmly believe that Kentuckians want uh, someone who has the litigation experience to actually go on our bench and to decide these cases. And to illustrate this, I must correct uh, my opponent here, and I, I challenge her to show me the cases where she has uh, been affirmed by the Supreme Court, because by of my count, as of yesterday, with her decisions that she has written that the Supreme Court has looked at, they have reversed or vacated her decision 54% of the time. And after 25 years of experience, you think that would not be happening. Um, my 19 years of experience as a litigator, I am the only one who has litigated at the, both the appellate levels, both the Kentucky Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals, as well as the federal courts up to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm the only candidate that has uh, litigated for at least 10 years before uh, actually deciding any cases. I think that I am the better, more comprehensive fit as your Supreme Court Justice, and I welcome your questions. Please come and check out my campaign page. You can get to it on Facebook through Aaron Izzo for Kentucky Supreme Court. I welcome your questions and I respond to them. I also ask for your vote this November, and thank you very much. So, first off, Goodwine was pretty, uh, I don't know, it kind of seemed angry body language-wise. I know most of you couldn't see it. But her tone of voice mixed with her body language, very angry towards the end. In a way, she wasn't with any other question. She was very like, I, I don't know why. I, maybe it's because she practiced it and just felt more confident. So she just seemed, it just came across as angry. 
because this entire rest of time, she's never pointed, she's never loud, and then in closing, she got loud and very pointed in her speech. But Izzo came in off the top ropes there, I think, and there's a moment that is worth mentioning where she says that Goodwine has had 52% of the opinion she has wrote overturned by the current state Supreme Court. It's no wonder why the teachers' unions and Bashir and others give so much money to her. They have a habit of supporting people who don't follow the law, and they have a habit of supporting judges that don't interpret the law well. That means the current state Supreme Court, which I'd argue is already pretty liberal, has said she's been wrong. The panel of Supreme Court has been wrong over half the amount of time. That should be embarrassing to an appeals judge. It's important we talk about appeals because, of course, everything that gets up to the Supreme Court is has been appealed up to the Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court. And so here she is, basically having a career where she's gotten it wrong the majority of the time. And yet, and yet, wants to be hired for an even better position, higher position. Wants to fail upwards. I don't know. 52% of the time, if you were on the fence before, I think alone that 52% number should give you a lot of pause about voting for somebody who is so abjectly just failed as, a, as an appellate judge. But anyways, that's all I got time for today on the Andrew Cooper Show. Thank you all so, so much for joining me. We'll see you next time. Have a great rest of your day.